Welcome to another Nusida training session to get more familiar with the Gherkin testing language. In this presentation I would basically like to address three topics. First, there will be a very short introduction to behavior-driven development. The main content will be to think about what makes a scenario good and we are going to do this through identifying and fixing some common problems that I see. Be aware where I'm trying to help make a better BDD process and of course, at the end, we are wrapping things up. I will present six core principles that you will hopefully also find useful like I do. Give us a thumbs up if you like this content and want to see more videos on this topic. In terms of any questions, please leave a comment. We will answer these. Let's jump into the first part. So, as I said, I would like to give a very, very short introduction. What is BDD and Behavior Driven Development? When searching for behavior-driven development and trying to find some definition for that, there will be quite a lot. I was trying to find something which is simple enough and focuses really on the key values of behavior-driven development. And behavior-driven development, at least for me, is about understanding, documenting, and verifying business requirements through illustrative examples. These are probably the most important things. Next, we would like to understand the requirements. For this, we must want to have a better collaboration on discussing and discovering the requirements. We would like to document them in the form of BDD scenarios as you will see and obviously, we will also use these BDD scenarios to verify our application. BDD is primarily focusing on the business requirements. There are other requirements as well, but these are not typically the primary focus of BDD. Through this process illustrative examples will help us. We will not talk too much about the examples today, but if you check out the previous webinar then you will hear a little bit more about that. So just to put this definition into a more visual representation, this is how you can imagine that. On one side we have the requirements, not necessarily written down requirements, but expectations from the business side. And on the other side, we will have the application that we will need to implement, which would be good software in this case. Furthermore, one side is sitting in the problem domain, the other is sitting in the solution domain and we would like to connect these two. The specification elements of the BDD scenarios are somehow making the connection between these two parties. They are sitting in the middle. They are part of shared ownership. They are still understandable by the business, but still provide enough detail. They're concrete enough so that we can use them during the development process. As it sits in the middle, on one hand it validates, it makes understandable requirements, and on the other hand, it can help. It can be used to verify the application running it as a test and seeing it passing or failing, which is very good feedback about the application's functional quality. This picture, which is the visualization of the process, also helps us to see what kind of typical activities and what kind of typical tasks you need to do or need to integrate into your development process once you practice BDD. The first step, which we call discovery, is about how we can better discuss the requirements and how we can collect examples during these discussions. Those will be a very good starting point and foundation for writing scenarios. Once we have made the discovery and have the examples, the next step is the formulation. When we take these examples and document them as PDD scenarios, writing them down and checking them into the source code, they become a sort of living documentation because they will be there until the lifetime of your project. However, you can always run them, and they turn either red or green. This means that they are indicating whether the application is fulfilling that. We are documenting these examples. These are the formulation, task, formulation activity, and obviously also the automation, which is very important when we take these scenarios and automate the system through these scenarios. Basically, these are the three BDD activities that you will need to focus on. And today we will focus on the formulation parts of how to provide good BDD scenarios and how to document the examples as good BDD scenarios. I mentioned the examples a couple of times. As I said, I don't want to go too much into that, but just to give you an impression of what I mean when I say example. What you see on the screen is a simple note or an index card with handwritten bullet points somebody has collected. It's a step-by-step -step story or step-by-step -step description of how the application is going to be used once it is implemented. This is a very good mental preparation for development. 
we can imagine upfront how the application will work, thus we are able to write down how the users will interact with the system and how the system will behave in response. In this case, if this is a trivial site, then maybe, as one example, you are registering a team and getting an easy question. If you answer it correctly, then you get 10 points. This shows an aspect of the scoring system of this application. This is an example. This is what we call the discovery phase. But today we are focusing on the formulation. Thus, we are turning these examples into BDD scenarios that you have probably seen. These use the keywords given, when, and, then, usually. And as you can see right now, I have rephrased my example into a BDD scenario. The content is the same, so it says, correct easy answer score is 10. It's given that I registered a team and when I submit a correct easy answer, then my score should be 10. It's basically the same as what I wrote down, but now it's properly phrased. Now I can check this in. This is part of my documentation, and this is very important because people who see BDD for the first time, they just see these scenarios as tests. But they are more than tests because they also illustrate the requirements. Additionally, they also document the behavior and obviously they are also automated tests. Meaning inspecting how good BDD scenario look like, what makes up a good BDD scenario in general and what makes the scenario good. Right now, we are working on a second book which is exactly focusing on this part. And as part of preparing for that book, we have basically collected six different principles that are important for good building designers. We will go into these six principles, but instead I would like to focus on seeing what makes a scenario good and what can make it bad. This would be good when checking out the internet for some examples, because unfortunately not every scenario that you find there is good. And whenever I'm visiting some customers, they sometimes have some bad scenarios. And just to give you an example of that, I was trying to make up a bad scenario for myself. This is how it looks. I had to simplify it a little bit because it was too long. Right now, this is 27 lines, but I have already seen a scenario which was more than 100 lines. So just imagine this scenario times 4 or something like that. That could be a good example for a bad scenario. It's best if you look at this scenario and try to read it one by one since I will not read it through fully. But then somewhat I think we can understand the individual things. So, I could say that it's given that I navigate to some URL, when I wait until the link becomes visible, the browser title is as it's written there. I click on the link, I wait some milliseconds, I click on the link, ask a question. In conclusion, we can understand what happens in the individual bits. You can even probably run this scenario and it just passes or fails. But there is still a big problem with this scenario. This scenario behaves like a test, so it sometimes turns green, sometimes turns red. But unfortunately, we have absolutely no idea what it is for. What do I want to say? So, we understand the individual bits of that, but we don't understand the test focus. What do we want to say in test? Working a little bit like that, you can ask a question, select some categories, and select some text. Basically, that is what you have seen in this very long scenario. The problem with this scenario is that somehow it is not focusing on the high-level goal of the scenario but on the individual mechanics of what do I need to do or how do I need to automate this to turn into a test. When doing BDD what we would like to do is to document the requirements to get feedback from the business. These are the primary goals. We want to enable some collaboration. Meaning, we would like to enable some communication between the business side and the solution side. However, they will not be able to give feedback if the scenarios are focusing so much on these mechanics or technical solution details like this scenario did. Even though they understand what a click and fill is. Meaning they can understand the individual lines, but they cannot understand the entire scenario. They are probably not able to give you feedback or at least not at the right level. This is a trap. I would like to highlight very much that it's so easy to fall into this trap because it's so easy to come up with such a scenario. You just need to automate a couple of stacks like how to click a link, how to enter something into a text box and how to navigate to a URL and it will seem like you have a working test. However, these kinds of solutions are not scaling. 
So right now, it works, but if you have 10 of them or hundreds of them then it will be a maintenance nightmare. At the end it will be like a parasite which is eating up your efforts and energy, but they don't really provide any value. So be careful about that and not go into this. Try not to go into this trap. If you have gone into this trap, then we need to fix the things. Unfortunately, fixing such scenarios is not that easy. It's a painfully hard job because you must reverse engineer what the actual scenario wanted to do and turn it back into that. Just try to find the meaning of that. Thus, it's better to avoid that right from the beginning. But I mean if you already have such a bad scenario, we have no better option than trying to fix it and this is what I would do with this example of trying to fix this mechanics focused scenario. When I do the fix, I will use these principles that I have already highlighted. We call them brief principles. Basically, we call them brief principles because the initial letters of the first five principles make up the word brief, which is also an important principle. So that's the sixth one. However, what are these five principles? They are called business language, real data, intention revealing, essential and focused. Now, I try to use these principles to fix my ugly scenario and you will see how you can use these principles in practice. Let's start with the first one. We will start with the letter B, which is the business language. We will be trying to find the business language that expresses our intentions. Let's go back to the ugly scenario. Primarily, this is a very harsh thing because what you need to do is to go step by step and try to understand what we wanted to do with this step or with a couple of steps together. Sometimes, we either need to talk to the business or colleagues. Thus, this is not something which is very simple. Of course, for my demonstration this has already been prepared. Therefore, it will be a bit simpler in this session compared to the daily business. Let's do a few steps of that just get to know the rhythm of that. The first thing that I have identified are these first two lines. So, given I navigate to some URL and I wait until this home link becomes visible. Basically, what I wanted to say with that is that I'm checking the home page. The technical implementation is how I check the home page. So, the next step is that the browser title is Spec Overflow Home. Well, the good question is, why it would be important for someone to check exactly the title. So maybe what we wanted to say is that generally, not necessarily the browser title, but the home page title is Spec Overflow Home. That is probably what needed to be highlighted. With that we can go forward to the next steps. Right now, I have removed some steps to make it shorter. These are the steps which are related to the login. So, you click on the login page or respectively the login link, you enter your username, password and click on the login button. After that you would probably wait. That was likely the original set of steps. What we want to do with these couple of steps is to make sure that we are logged in. The next big steps or rather the next big range of steps, which are clicking the link, asking the question, waiting, clearing the textbooks, entering something into the text box, entering something else into some other textbooks and finally clicking a button, were probably used to register a question or ask a new one. This is how I simplify that when I ask a new question. These are the details that you see here, which are what is the title, what is the body, what is the text that the user has entered and so on. So, I will not go further with that. This is a very painful and hard job, but you need to really go step by step and try to figure out what the individual steps are intended for and what we wanted to do with those steps. At the end we have a smaller scenario which is more expressed through the business language, not so much through the solution language. The test would not focus on the browser terms anymore, but it's showing what we initially intended with these things. But it's still long and not perfect. Nevertheless, we have taken our first step to turn it into a business language. Let's go to the second step, which is the letter F in this case. Here, we try to make the scenarios focused by illustrating a single rule. And whenever I say a rule, what I really mean is that right now if you look at this scenario, it's very hard to see what our purpose was altogether with this scenario. Even if you read the title question test, it doesn't really say anything and it's a long scenario. Typically, the dense steps are the ones which identify the verification elements of the scenario. 
However, if you look at the dense step in this example, you can see that there are a couple of them, and they even are across the entire scenario in different places. If we have these different dense steps, which are not even next to each other, the creator most likely wanted to do multiple or check multiple business rules or multiple acceptance criteria so to speak. But just now everything is chained up into a single scenario. You probably have seen such scenarios since it's a bit like what we usually do with manual testing. Because when we are doing manual testing, the most important resources are the human resources where we must go through them. Therefore, it makes sense to chain up all the different features into a longer user journey because this is how we can better use our efforts. However, for automated scenarios the things are a little bit different, because such a multi-rule or multi-purpose scenarios typically cause quite much bottleneck in the development process. It will introduce some sort of dependency between the different features. Nobody will really feel responsible for that scenario. Additionally, it will break very frequently and be brittle sometimes. Furthermore, random failures will be quite common with these scenarios, and it will not support the test-first approach. This means that you will not be able to implement this scenario fully before the implementation of the application because you would need to fulfill a lot of features to be able to implement that. Generally, we can say that small and focused scenarios are much better, even though we may have won some execution time with this scenario, we have lost a lot on the process and maintainability side. So, we should work on that. If you want to identify what the business rules are behind these different steps, again, this is a hard thing which you probably must discuss with the product owner or colleagues. Altogether, the question that you would need to ask is why? Meaning, why was it important for me to do this, then check the point, why was it important for me to verify this or that thing? Let's try to fix a couple of them. We can start with the first one. Then the title should be, Spec Overflow Home. Let's say that I have discussed it with my business and at the end it turned out that we want to check the availability of the application homepage after successful login. Whenever our users see it, they immediately know where they are and what they see. Now, I basically have split these two steps into a separate scenario. The application homepage is identifiable and basically it just contains these two steps. So, I can go forward. Let's check the other two dense steps. This is related to the result of asking the question. The homepage is activated, and the question should appear at the end. As it turns out, what we wanted to verify here is that new questions should be added to the question list. So now we have another scenario which describes that new questions should be added to the question list. Of course, now we can move on. Maybe the next one is related to the question details. What we identified here is that we wanted to verify whether the details of the question can be accessed from the question list. This was the important thing for us. Instead of having one bigger scenario with multiple dense steps, now we have a few smaller scenarios with only one dense step in each or only a few dense steps in each. Fundamentally, this is how we could get into the focal point, through which the scenarios are now much more focused. These scenarios are getting better and better. Of course, there are some duplications still, so we still must take some further steps. Let's move this to step number 3 which is the letter ISO, Intention Revealing. Next, we can reveal the intention rather than describing the mechanics. I mean, these scenarios are not that bad anymore. However, in two places you can still see some traces of expressing the mechanics. For example, if you look at the scenario in the bottom, it says, given I have logged in and I have added a question with some title, body, and text, which is describing how I can achieve my precondition. However, if you want to focus on the intention, you will need to move away from this. You need to move from, how do I achieve it, which is the mechanics, to what do I expect, which is the intention. Basically, what you can see is that the intention of these two steps was that somehow, we would need to ensure that there is a precondition, that there is a question added with that kind of idea. We don't care how they did that or how many steps you needed to do. The only thing we are interested in are the results and this is extremely important especially for the test automation because if you are stating with your intentions or the result in other words, then it opens a lot of space or a lot of options in the test automation. This event step in the bottom scenario could be automated in a way in which you are logging in and asking the questions through the website. 
that's one possibility. But now if you feel that it is too slow or too brittle, then we could just simply add the record to the database. This would also be a way to ensure this precondition. With that, we are not only making the scenario simpler and more understandable, but we can also make the automation bits much more optimal, and you can do further enhancements there. So, this is how you can imagine this intentional dealing. The, given I have logged in, was not much of a problem since I just changed it to, given I am logged in, which is just a small rephrasing. Instead of saying that I have logged in, which is implying what I had to do, I say, given I'm logged in, because I don't care how I did that, I'm just interested in the result. There's an alternative that's not so interesting. If I just rephrase these scenarios by focusing on the intentions, I will have even smaller and even better automatable scenarios from my original list. Let's go for step number four, which is nothing else than the letter E4, essential. Keep the essential details only. This is what we would like to see here. Fortunately, in this scenario there are not so many details. However, still you can see that it also states what the body and the text of the different of the individual the questions should be. Unfortunately, these details are not interesting for us in this scenario. We don't want to make an assertion for it or make any verification on that. Of course, we must submit some text to somebody, because otherwise maybe the form cannot be submitted, but we don't care about the details, really. However, now as they are stated here, in the scenario itself this might cause some sort of maintenance problems. Let's say maybe later we are just enabling some minimum lengths for the body, and it must be at least 20 characters. Now many of our scenarios suddenly start to break because they were using some sample data for the body, which is much shorter, even though this scenario has nothing to do with the body. In this case it's not that visible, but in some other cases, if you are showing some details, they can be a little bit confusing because people don't understand why you needed this body, or it was so important to have these tags here. Generally, what we can say is that more details are not necessarily causing more quality clarity, so overall unnecessary, unimportant, irrelevant, and incidental details typically cause confusion. And as I said, they are bad for maintainability, so we would like to get rid of them. We would like to clean up our scenario from that. In my case this was simple. I just got rid of the body and the text from this data table there for the test step. Of course, if you do the automation, you cannot just remove these details, since we need these details for the automation. We need to enter some text. What we are doing is pushing it down to the automation layer. In the automation layer we have much better options to manage that. For example, we can put it into a constant value or share it across multiple steps. So, managing the default data and default details there is much easier. Since after that only the title remains, I could even just get rid of the data table and just say that when I ask a new question with, test question 1234, then this and this should happen. This is how we simplified this scenario. Here is our simplified version of this middle scenario. We got rid of the incidental data from there and this is basically bringing us to step 5, use real data. And this is the our letter from our brief principles. In this case, the data that we could play with a little bit or rather what we could think about is the title of the question, test question 1234. From a testing point of view, this data is perfect. I mean any letters would do, you could even write A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or lorem ipsum, or anything else. From the testing perspective it doesn't really matter. However, we said that with these scenarios we would like to enable collaboration, we would like to get feedback. So sometimes you can get much better feedback if you are using some data which is a little bit closer to the data that the users are providing. If I just see a question with a title like, test question 1234, it doesn't really tell me a story of how the users were using my system. It doesn't indicate whether case sensitivity is important or brings me into any interesting discussions. On the other hand, if you would just replace that with the more realistic data, in this case, something like, how to write better BDD scenarios, then maybe that's helping us with imagining how this system will be used. These are typical questions. What kind of question words do we use? Shall it be unique or not? So, there are probably a lot of interesting questions that you can come up with if you see real data. 
Sometimes concrete pieces of real data can better illustrate what we want to explain. Of course, this is a matter of style, and you can play with it whether you are phrasing something a little bit more abstract or more concrete. Even this scenario could be expressed in a more abstract way. Just saying that when I ask the question then the question should appear in the question list. But generally, I'd like to put a little bit of concrete real data in there. It's typically better expressing the problem and our intention for that scenario. This brings us to the last one, which is to keep the scenarios brief. Through all these changes and simplifications that we have made so far, our scenarios change to a very good size. So generally, what we say is that if the scenarios are short, it will be much easier to get feedback from the business. It will be much easier to maintain them, and it will altogether be much easier to work with these scenarios. Keeping them brief is also a very important principle. So basically, these were the six steps that we went through and at the end we have quite nice and brief scenarios. Maybe you can still make them better, but I think they are good enough. So maybe it's time to celebrate. Let's do the celebration, which for me is the summary of what we have done so far. Looking back, we have started from this very ugly scenario. Now we have much better and much more useful scenarios. This is what you can do, too. Whenever we were going through them, we were using these six principles, we used business language, meaning that we wanted to express the things using the language that everyone understands. We are not using the solution language. Additionally, we said that we would like to use real data, since it's much better at telling the story. We said that we would like to have the scenario's intention revealed. Furthermore, we rather want to focus on what we want to do without explaining the mechanics behind that, meaning how to do that. We want to only keep the essential data in there and leave out anything which is unimportant. And lastly, we want to keep our scenarios focused, hopefully only for illustrating a single rule or a single acceptance criterion and we would like to keep our scenarios brief, maybe about 5 lines which is a good size. Give us a thumbs up if you like this content and want to see more videos on this topic. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to stay in touch with us. Happy testing and see you next time.